Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to this last webinar on the series on youth and closing the innovation gap. I'm Dan Baba. I'm a professor of electrical engineering and bioengineering in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University. And I work on various topics related to artificial intelligence and innovation. In collaboration with the Africa CDC, the Center for African Studies at Harvard University holds these webinar series in order to paint an accurate picture on the COVID-19 situation in Africa. Each of these webinars begins by statistics from the Africa CDC on the current COVID-19 situation on the continent in the form of the African COVID by the number slide, which you saw when this seminar began. After we hear from my distinguished panelists that I'm super excited to have joined me today, we will have a Q&A session that you can participate to using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window, which you currently have open. We have a poll today, and I will ask that we show the poll. And this poll asks the following question. Do you agree that government and public and private partnerships should make investments that facilitate access to technology, particularly in early education? After I introduce the panelists, we will go through the results of the poll. So today joining me, I'm super excited to have here three panelists. The first one is Claire Akamamzi, who is a Rwandan lawyer, public administrator, businesswoman and a politician who has served as the executive director and chief executive officer of the Rwandan Development Board since 2017. This position is one cabinet level one that is appointed by the president of Rwanda. Claire is also an alumnus of Harvard Kennedy School where she received a master in public administration. We're super glad and excited to have Claire join us today. Also joining me is Professor Saram Avle, who is an assistant professor of communication in the Department of Communication at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Her research focuses on digital technology cultures across parts of Africa, China, and the United States. And this work primarily takes a critical approach towards understanding how digital technologies are made and used, as well as their implications for issues of labor, identity, and futures. Finally, joining us from the southern tip of Africa, Cape Town, is Mr. Okendo Lewis Gale, who is the founder and chairman of Haram Bins. Harambe is a network of young African entrepreneurs who are scaling ventures and building Africa's future. Okendo is also a graduate of Harvard Kennedy School like Claire and also has a master in public administration. And I just found out that Harambe means building something together, which is very appropriate for the topic that we're going to discuss today. What is this topic? So today we're here to talk about something I'm super excited about, which is to explore key issues around the role of technology and innovation in promoting socioeconomic transformation in our continent. Both as this relates to the response to the current COVID-19 crisis and to how we might envision or imagine a post COVID-19 economy on the continent. So our discussion, our conversation today is going to be broken down into three themes. So let me give you a sense of what these themes are going to be. What we'll first do is we're going to talk about evidence and examples of youth-driven innovations that we've seen prior, during, and that we might see after the COVID-19 crisis. Then we will have a discussion on how we can stimulate research and development funding in our countries in general. And finally, I want to close with something that uh, is very important to me, which is how do we empower the youth in our country and prepare them for thinking about innovation and technology as, to, as a means um, for personal development. So beginning with the topic of technology, innovation and COVID-19. So one thing that the current crisis has showed is that there are opportunities that exist for new and innovative ways of thinking about production and manufacturing. And most and many of these opportunities have primarily been driven by the youth. So taking the example of uh, one of my home countries, Senegal, a doctor robot was built that could take patients' temperature, deliver food and drugs and speak French, English, and some of the local languages, similar to robots that were developed in Rwandan clinics in order to treat patients. 
So beginning with this topic of technology and innovation, I want to start with you first, uh, Okendo. So in response to COVID-19, what are some examples of innovative technology-driven solutions that you have seen or perhaps even implemented yourself? And do you have a sense of how supportive governments were of these solutions? Well, thank you, uh, Demba, for that. And, and really thank you to the Dream Team at the Africa Center for bringing us all together and the professor again for taking the time and the questions. I, I must confess, I leap at every opportunity to be of service to the Little Red School on the Charles River, as I call it. My mama still can't believe y'all let me in. <laughs> I, uh, I believe it was um, Reverend Peter Gomes from the Harvard Memorial Church who once noted that graduates of Harvard um, stand in an unbroken procession that stretches all the way back to Moses, who would himself have gone to Harvard had he had a chance. I like to joke that I am the one admission mistakes that broke that procession, but which is why I'm always happy to be of service in any way I can. So uh, thank you all for, for bringing us together in this very important topic. I, I think we have seen, uh, in a way, this is sort of a bit of a golden year for uh, innovation across Africa. And in Harambe, we've been blessed to see a great many Harambians step up to the plate and answer the call. Um, one company in specific that comes to mind um, is the efforts of a Harambian by the name of Dr. William Mafam. And Dr. Mafam is the founder of a company called uh, Vula Mobile. And v Vula Mobile is in the business of helping uh, primary healthcare workers in rural areas connect with specialists in urban centers. Um, it's an app-based solution that is now enabling, um, you know, folks in the um, uh, patients in rural areas to really connect with these doctors that happen, happen to be in the cities, uh, which drives efficiency into the system, but it also reduces the number of unnecessary trips that people have to make from the rural areas to the urban centers. And one of the fascinating things that's happened during COVID is the Ministry of um, uh, Department of Health of South Africa has actually included Vula Mobile as part of its uh, response to COVID um, and have done a number of initiatives through this app. Uh, and this company has just managed to raise close to $3 million in the middle of this pandemic to scale its operations across the continent. And so what I think we are seeing there is not only the ability of entrepreneurs to respond, but also uh, how responsive governments can actually leverage this technology enthusiasm. And I think uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to have Claire in these conversations, because when you talk about responsive governments, it seems that uh, uh, Claire should be in the picture of a dictionary, uh, because uh, what the Run and Development Board is doing and, and working with entrepreneurs is exactly what needs to happen across the continent. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that insight, uh, Okendo. And uh, speaking of that, after I uh, first speak with uh, Sarum, I will get to exactly what you just mentioned, which is the responsiveness, the tremendous responsiveness that Rwanda has shown in the middle of this crisis. But so, Okendo, you've given us a sense of basically the situation now during COVID-19, right? Mm. I want to turn to Sarum and uh, ask you, Sarum, so can you give us a sense briefly about the history of youth-driven innovation that has been in Africa prior to COVID-19 and how the presence of that dynamism has contributed to the agility that we see now during the current crisis? All right, thank you, Demba. Um, just like Okendo, I am also really pleased to, to be joining this uh, webinar. Um, and it's a really good question that you ask. Um, so for a few years now, I've been uh, embedded in a number of networks in Ghana, um, Ethiopia, and to some extent in Kenya as well, um, mostly uh, spending time with uh, makers. And so individuals who identify as makers um, if you're not familiar with, with the notion of makers, of course, it's people really who do, uh, who like to tinker uh, on, on some level uh, with uh, all kinds of materials and, and, and create things, make things with your hands. Um, and African makers, for as long as we can you know, uh, remember, have been uh, making a number of devices and things uh, that are often um, labeled as either grassroots innovation or you know, appropriate technology. There's been a lot of different uh, names attached to the kinds of things that we see. Um, but they're all quite innovative. And so for, for me, the Ghana example, um, my favorite example is uh, Snoo Code, um, which is a, a company that makes a location, uh, um, a product that you can use whether you have a smartphone or a dumb phone. And, it, and Snoo Code has been sort of 
uh, collaborating with the Ghana police, the Ghana uh, ambulance services, um, and their, the business model has changed over time, but it is a really essential technology that is quite flexible that you can use on a smartphone, but also caters to uh, populations that may not be able to afford those kinds of uh, uh, smartphone technologies. Uh, and so by looking through maker communities, I find that uh, in the last uh, few years, the key thing that looked different for me is that they are um, organizing and collaborating a bit more. Um, and so you'll find groups of makers in Accra who will meet um, or get, you know, join uh, little programs on WhatsApp or Facebook and share uh, ideas and knowledge, which is really critical because you start to get the kind of uh, network effects that you need um, for these some of these uh, products to, to go from someone's home into the marketplace, right? And so I've seen conversations on, for instance, the Makers WhatsApp group, where people who are tinkering at home are able to then uh, sell what they've done uh, to someone else. And before you know it, there's a market that's been established. So that organizing and collaborating, um, I think is partly responsible for the dynamism that we see here because it allows people to quickly share information about what they've done. Um, it also allows them to pull resources really quickly, right? And so uh, another uh, good example is how um, these makers get together to uh, source components. In the past, you had to kind of find it on your own, say on AliExpress, um, but together, if you're able to pull resources, you can actually get a better pricing uh, through volume and, and get the kind of components that you need, whether they're sensors for your little uh, project or whatever it is that you need to input. And so that organizing, I think, is really crucial. And that's what helps them to also tell the stories that they need to tell for us to be able to hear them um, and to connect them. And so by being um, even more organized, they can get the attention of their governments, they can get international researchers to, to pay the attention that they need. And so I think that's, for me, a really key distinction uh, in how a lot of the making communities across Ghana, you know, Nigeria, Ethiopia, elsewhere, um, have changed over the last few years. That's great. Thank you for that, Sarah. Uh, just, just following up a little bit on that point, Sarah, is it fair to say that part of the agility we've seen during COVID or in response to COVID uh, was prepared by this dynamism that was already there? Would, would you say that that's an accurate description? Or... Um, to some degree, right? Um, you know, it's, it's always difficult to speak of Africa as a whole. And so um, for me, the, sure, the sure. little examples I have Let's from take Ghana, the example of Ghana. Uh, Let's take the example there. of Ghana. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I would say, so for instance, one of my favorite uh, examples is this young man um, who for a long time, uh, you know, kept dropping out of school for multiple reasons, right? Um, but every time I went back to do field work, I would find him hanging out with makers and the hubs and people, you know, professors, like a, a wide range of people um, who've noticed that this, this young man is quite skilled. Um, at making a number of different things. He's just really picked up information really quickly. He's always on YouTube. Uh, he's looking into the open source communities. Uh, and recently, while I was you know, trying to figure out what's going on in the Ghana scene, I noticed that he had been folded into an academic group in a place called Academic City. Um, he was kind of hanging out in the back of the video, um, sort of like tinkering with a, a, a design for a ventilator that the professor was, was, was um, being interviewed for on television. And I think this is this is the key thing is that the organizing and the collaborating creates relationship building that brings people who may typically be left out of these spaces that we privilege as being sites of innovation, for instance, the hub, um, but brings in people who are incredibly skilled into the fold and then you can sort of build on. So you can build on these relationships. And I think that's really, uh, I think it's, it's part of why some of these COVID innovations um, get to the media as quickly as they do so that we can tell these stories, um, but also to get the resources that they need to scale, which is a really important factor in thinking about innovation, right? And skill doesn't have to be some automatic thing that Silicon Valley says we value, but skill in a way that gets the things that are needed, for instance, if it's a ventilator or whatever the design, the hand washing basin, to get it to the village um, around the villages around Accra, that's scaling too. It's a different kind of skill. It's a different kind of valuing of skill. Um, but yes, I do think that these relationships are uh, vital in why and how this dynamism plays out in the in the COVID era um, of innovation. That that was great, Sarah. I mean, I want you to hold that thought for me because in the third part we will talk precisely about this skill building and potential non-traditional ways of of making that happen in the context of Africa. But Claire, I want to turn to you now, um, and as uh, Okendo has mentioned, right? So. One of the things that has been impressive about Rwanda in particular 
is the innovative manner in which and the agility with which they have been able to respond to the current crisis that we find ourselves in. So I want to ask you first, what do you think are key factors that made that possible for Rwanda? And second, how do you see this maintained after COVID and potentially how do you see this scaled up to not simply Rwanda, but other people in the vicinity or perhaps in the continent? I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Demba, and uh, very uh, thankful for the invitation to the Harvard Center for African Studies for this uh, session. Um, first of all, I think from what we've heard from both Seram and Okendo is that uh, creativity and innovation exists in Africa. And uh, in many ways, African uh, people, especially the youth, are very innovative. And this has been a case for many, many years. But I think the question and the missing gap has always been, do, we, do they have the environment that they need to facilitate their innovations to get to marketplace or to get to the final use? And I think that is where the role of government comes in. And what we've understood in Rwanda is that once the government creates the right environment, and creates uh, and invests in the enabling ecosystem requirements for innovation, and then that is really going to happen. And we're going to discover a lot more gems than we thought we had, or that we knew we had just because we didn't create the right environment for that. And so for Rwanda, I think the main factor, first of all, was for the government of Rwanda to recognize and articulate a vision that was very much um, based on promoting technology and innovation. And so that meant that from policy, from infrastructure, from education. This was going to be a key part of what we were doing as a country in order to promote and grow the ecosystem that is required to support uh, both technology use and, and innovation. And if I could just give a few examples of what we did as a country to do that, and this is really before COVID-19, this is uh, over the last 20 years or so. One of them was really infrastructure. I think it's really important to have infrastructure that supports innovation whether it's uh, ICT infrastructure. For us, uh, the government invested um, over $200 million to put in place fiber optic infrastructure for, to the rest of the country. 95% of our country today has fiber optic uh, infrastructure. And that is not just um, government money, but we also attracted private sector money to do that. I think the biggest investment we had to this end was with Korea Telecom. So really also putting in place a business environment where you can have Korea Telecom come and invest in uh, 4G, LTE fiber optic infrastructure was very important. So infrastructure was one really, really key point. Second was also government being the example, the example when it comes to adopting uh, you know, innovative ideas. So right from uh, how government is run, right from um, even just the Rwanda Development Board was an innovation, uh, the organization that I lead, it's a major of, it's a one-stop center in, in the true sense of the word. We are an organization that promotes private sector investments, exports, tourism, intellectual property as one organization. So being able to build one uh, uh, organization with no red tape, no bureaucracy in itself was also an innovation. But specifically adopting e-government, for example, we have uh, all our procurement. If you want to do procurement in Rwanda, you have to uh, bid and tender online. Uh, if you'd like to um, apply for any service, whether it's a passport, whether it's a birth certificate, whether it's a death certificate, whether it's land registration, all of that is done through one government portal called Irembo. So government also being the example and really using uh, and, 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 and being the, the, the example in using innovative ideas, I think is another very important one. Now, because of those innovations and because of those investments that government had put in place, when COVID-19 happened, we were able to benefit uh, from those investments before. And again, if I could just talk a bit, a little bit about some of the, the innovations we saw coming out of uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, but also learning and taking advantage of the investments we had before. One of them is uh, moving to online um, services because when the lockdown happened, schools had to go online. Um, E-commerce, uh, companies that were providing e-commerce tripled within the first month of the lockdown, but they were able to do this because there was internet, because there was fiber optic, because there was infrastructure that was built before. And a lot of e-commerce, even after the pandemic, even today, most of us today buy food and groceries online, something that not everybody did. Uh, cashless uh, uh, transactions, again, partnership with the private sector, extremely important. We mobilized uh, MTN, Airtel, and other uh, mobile telecom companies to reduce or to remove the cost of cashless transactions. 
And that had a direct relationship with how we saw a lot more cashless transactions happening uh, in the country. So again, partnership with the private sector and mobilizing private sector to come. We also negotiated for the education sector with the sites that are providing educational materials to do that free of charge. So these partnerships are also really important for us to see these um, innovative ideas get to, use even, to be used even more. Another one was also promoting production of homemade solutions to fight COVID-19 uh, pandemic. One of them was uh, face shields that were designed and manufactured in Rwanda. So today, all our medical personnel, the face shields they use are designed and made in Rwanda by a company called PharmaLab. Uh, we're also able to adopt technology from outside the world, outside Rwanda, such as robots that you mentioned before, or use of bracelets to follow people that are taking their quarantine at home. So you don't have to congest hospitals, but you can still monitor them using bracelets that um, 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 are monitored through the command post that we have in the country. And maybe the final one, which is also an innovation, but not necessarily technolo technological innovation, was something that we're very proud of, which is uh, in order to manage the cost of testing for COVID-19, which was very expensive, our people together with, the, with the, one of the institutions called AIMS, the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences, came up with a formula for pooled testing, where instead of testing every one person and the cost of testing was about $50, uh, getting samples from very many people and you test them at the same time uh, using fewer materials. And if all of them are negative, then that's excellent. But if one of them is positive, then you have to test each and every one of them uh, because one of them is positive. So those kinds of innovative approaches are very useful for the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Demba. Uh, no, no problem at all. I'm glad you finished with that example because people like me work on the mathematics of how do you do that? How, what, what are the mathematics of how you pull tests? So I would definitely love to connect uh, with you. And this is related to a discussion I want to have towards the end, which is what is the role of the diaspora in helping these things, right? But we'll come back to this. But you've given me a nice segue to our second theme, uh, Claire, which is uh, funding for R&D. So I'm not going to go through the numbers, but it should not surprise all of us here that African countries on average are the ones in the world that invest the least in research and development, R&D, okay? So what I wanna ask you, Claire, is uh, from, from what sources of funding, perhaps you can lead in with the example of Rwanda, but what sources of funding do you think countries should tap into to fund research and development and to fund the creation of what you mentioned earlier, which is this infrastructure that enables innovation by the youth? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Demba. So for, for R&D funding, uh, the way we've approached it in Rwanda, we think that there's a role of government, but also the role of private sector. So first of all, government must put aside some money from their budget to finance R&D. I think that's very important. What we put in place is something called the National Innovation and Research uh, Development Fund, which is really funding ideas at that level before they become uh, commercialized. And that's a very risky area because ideas are not, yet, uh, 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 not yet commercialized and you don't expect to make a return necessarily. So you should be able to risk that money and, and burn that money. So our government put in place some money on its own from our budget directly to finance R&D. But also I think that we must incentivize uh, private sector to do that. The way we've done it in Rwanda is that uh, if you invest uh, in R&D, we allow you to completely deduct it for tax purposes. So it's an incentive for the private sector to also um, invest in it. And we must think about other ways. Some countries have done matching grants. Uh, if a company invests in R&D, then the government also gives them a grant at the same tune just to encourage them to do that. So there must be ways of incentivizing private sector to also invest in R&D, but also tapping into development institutions. Uh, we've, we've set up something called the Rwanda Innovation Fund and the money purely came from uh, the seed capital, $30 million came from uh, African Development Bank. And uh, African Development Bank had never uh, done anything like that before. But when they saw the, 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 the potential of supporting R&D and how that can actually uh, improve the economic benefits of a country, they were able to give us $30 million to create this Rwanda Innovation Fund. So I believe there's a role for private sector governments, but also working with the development institutions to finance R&D. Thank you. Great, great, great. Thank you. And you've given me a perfect segue for uh, Okendo here. So Okendo, uh, private sector. First, so can you expand a little bit on the role that you think the private sector can play in R&D investment? And second, when can we, what do you think we can learn from the experience of other developed or developing nations outside of the continent that you might be aware of? Um, gotcha. Feel free to take the question whichever way you, you think fits best. Awesome. Well Thank you, Demba, and, and again, really thank you 
uh, clear. I, you know, in the alliance here as Harambias, we are all big fans of Rwanda and call us crazy, but we all think that if we could just get the rest of the cotton, we'd all be uh, led by clear like individuals, all would be fine. And, uh, I, you know, we're also big fans of Rwanda because it's the only country so far that has a Harambian as a minister. Uh, Mr. Oh. Ibsen Radukunda, here, here, here. Uh, Ibsen Radukunda there is a minister of uh, ICT and innovation. So uh, we love Rwanda and the Alliance, uh, Claire. So thank you so much. Uh, to answer your question directly, Mbemba, I, I think um, one example of R&D and private sector, um, it, again, I have to go back to the micro level and some what I'm seeing through the Harambians. And we have a Harambian uh, leading a company um, in uh, Nigeria and the company is called Metro Africa Express. And uh, the promise of Metro Africa Express is that they'll um, deliver any product or anyone in Lagos within three hours. And if you know traffic in Lagos, you were like, good luck with that. Uh, but the way they do it is they use these Okadas, these mopeds, sort of motorini and scooting around the city. Um, and what's interesting about their approach is this is a for-profit venture to raise millions of dollars now to scale up their operations uh, across uh, the country. Uh, but there are some elements that they're still trying to understand how they work and they're not yet profitable. And so they partner with foundations to support the R&D, right? And so here's a for-profit company that is still trying to figure out how to reach the unreachable. Um, and, uh, and some private sector folks have said, well, we will give you um, uh, investments to scale up the parts that of the business that are proven uh, and you've learned how to monetize. And then we'll also support, uh, give you grants to support the, the areas that are still relevant to the development of your venture and also transportation in the country, but uh, still need some work. And so that's a very innovative uh, type of approach that we're seeing in the Alliance. Um, as, when it comes to uh, other examples um, across the world, um, I was very fortunate participating in something called the uh, World Government Summit run by the government of Dubai. And as part of it, they had something called, a, uh, something is run by one of our friends called um, Noah Radford. It was called the Dubai Future Foundation. And, and these folks really, I guess, leave it to Dubai, but they have figured out a way to, um, the government is directly investing in, in unproven technologies to try to create prototypes, right? So they know that we need to figure out the drones. They know they need to figure out how to use AI and they'll find folks driving innovative solutions in the space and will fund it uh, mostly to begin to figure out the regulatory environment and how it might work. Uh, and so you're seeing in, in Dubai, I think, and, and in particular, the efforts of Noah Rafford and the Dubai Future Foundation a very effective model, a very proactive model, one that says, you know, we know these technologies are critical to the development of our countries. Um, let's um, attempt to identify innovators and support those efforts. So, so, so there's a few examples happening out there. That was great. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Kendo. Um, now coming to you, uh, Sarah, um, kind of switching, slightly switching topics within this topic of uh, R&D investment. So China, as we know, over the past uh, decade or two, has had a significant uh, involvement uh, with Africa, with the continent. So do you see the relationship that um, lots of our countries have had with China playing a role in opportunities for R&D investment? If so, why or why not? What, what, are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Um, short answer is certainly, right? Um, just like anything, I think it depends on who the actors are and what types of relationships are being forged. So I already see a bit of it in the private sector for in, in which you know Ghanaians, Nigerians, Ethiopians um, are finding collaborations with Chinese uh, business folk online, right? Uh, whether it's through Made in China or AliExpress, I mean, it seems a bit uh, inconsequential, but it is where uh, people are starting to collaborate with Chinese partners and it, it, it's collaboration that is geared toward um, uh, getting people's designs to prototype and from prototype to market. Um, you know, some of the research I've been doing, in the, you know, and, and talking to Chinese in, in the south of China, in the Guangzhou, Shenzhen area, 
suggest that when Africans come to, to manufacturers, they come with designs that are actually tailored for their context, that they're not asking for uh, blind replications, right? And so there is some strategic and intentional collaboration happening within particular sites. Um, and so, and I think that's really essential because you get to prototype using things that you may not have, but it's also tapping into networks that have the expertise that you may also not have, but they're learning, right? Um, and the assumption there is not that the Africans don't come with expertise. They are coming with expertise that the Chinese also want. Um, you know, and, and it may be market expertise, it may be design expertise, but the encouraging collaborations in that way actually will be quite beneficial. Um, that said, you know, it requires, I think, on a larger scale, more intentional and careful agreements at the state level, right? Um, so it is that when a state goes to the negotiation table, it's not to show up with your 10 fingers and, and sort of just talk about what is happening, but be strategic and write out what you want. And if it is, uh, you know, investments in science and technology, you go and you ask for that. It's about a negotiation because the person at the other end of the table wants something from you and, and you have something. And so the win-win is not a theory, uh, it, you know, it, it has to be in practice and Africans need to be uh, a bit more uh, assertive in, in making demands. Um, so for instance, uh, one little project we have going on the outskirts of Addis Ababa, um, we noticed that there are a number of uh, small electronic factories um, setting up in the outskirts of Addis Ababa. And, and from where we stand, it appears that a key concern for the Ethiopian government is youth, youth employment, right? And so if you are able to employ people in your factory, it all is good. They check up on you, they make sure that you're not treating the workers badly, so on and so forth. Um, and that's all well and good, but it turns out that a lot of the management and staff um, are, are sidelining even the senior Ethiopians in terms of the business, uh, in terms of the uh, intellectual property, in terms of all of the things that um, I, I reckon we're hoping will trickle down. Trickle down doesn't really work if you're not intentional. Um, and so if you think about how China itself, since opening up you know, 30, 30 years ago, uh, it, it required intentional investments, right? In, in, in asking for a, a, a particular kinds of foreign direct investments, not just opening up to everything. Um, Shenzhen was, an, was, a, was, a, was a special economic zone, but the Chinese government was experimenting with particular ways of, of, of having a market economy. And that very uh, intentional approach is what created the Shenzhen today that is essentially creating the electronics for the rest of the world. And so if Africans are sending a lot of our students to China, and this is, this is the case where recently uh, one report suggested that African students are, um, are uh, sending more students to China than they are to the US and to Europe. And so if we're sending our students to China, what are, they, what are we sending them to study? Is it uh, STEM, is it STEAM? Because I think arts are also important, right? In, in this, this whole uh, educational exchange. Um, and also, you know, the, the Chinese visa rules means that they can't actually stay there, which is a bonus for us because they return. Um, so if you're just, if you think about the way China itself since opening up um, pursued educational and uh, technological investment, the people that we are negotiating with or, or uh, engaging with more have set the precedent. I'm not saying we should follow blindly, but there are nuggets there that you know, our leaders can uh, also get inspiration from. Um, and, and, and once your, your students return from getting that robotics degree or whatever it is, is not to leave them alone, but to make that investment. And I'm glad that Claire has mentioned this uh, because it's really important for our governments to show uh, confidence in our students and our skilled labor. Um, one of the key complaints I heard early in my research in Ghana was that um, you know, people will make all kinds of things and go to the government and say, hey, we created this thing that would be beneficial for the country. And they'll say, okay, okay, great. Uh, talk to my assistant later and nothing comes of it. And then they spend millions of dollars getting a foreign entity to provide the service when a local uh, company has already provided. So showing confidence when your students uh, or your, your young people show that they have some innovative idea, it may fail, which is fine, but other governments invest in that failure at some point. And that's how you build the skill and you, you build the muscle that you need to continue innovating. And so I think lots of opportunities with China um, and, and you know, the most important thing is to be strategic and intentional in that engagement, whether it's at the state level or at the individual level where you're a business person collaborating, make sure that the terms are conducive to what you want to accomplish and, and, and sort of work towards that rather than just going with um, some sort of like, <laughs> take whatever you can get approach. I think being more intentional is the key uh, operative word here in the relationship with China. Totally. 
Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, before you move to the third team now, precisely, uh, Sarah, on how we empower the youth to do this, how do we empower them to fail and innovate and make that okay, right? Before we go there, I actually want to give a chance for uh, Claire to come in here. So one of the things that I love about the Rwandan example, and just looking at this from the perspective of a, of a scientist, right, is the balance the country has been able to strike between homegrown innovation and also building strategic relationships with the outside. So how do you see this question of R&D funding coming, for example, from China or other outside sources? What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on striking that balance? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I really liked uh, the point that Sarah uh, mentioned about how you relate to countries like China. A lot of times I'm asked questions uh, about uh, you know, is, is China investments very good uh, for Rwanda? You know, when they come to invest in most countries, they come with their own staff. So you have an investment, but it's employing only Chinese. And the question, we, the answer we always give them is, but who admits them to come to the country? Who gives them the work permit? Who, who, who regulates the labor force in the country? It's the government. So you cannot, the problem is not that it's not China or any other country for that matter. The problem is the, that country that doesn't have a policy that is beneficial uh, for it. So Sarah, I totally agree with you. If you're dealing with any country, first of all, you must have your own uh, uh, strategic priorities before you go to that country. And if you don't, then you'll take whatever the country gives you. And I think that's a, a really important point about how we relate, not just with China, but with the rest of the world. We must, what, we must know our interests first because partners come with their own interests. And anyway, so back to your point, Demba, about how we balance between homegrown solutions and, and uh, importing solutions from outside. Uh, first of all, we know that at the end of, uh, of it all, Rwanda wants to de deploy uh, solutions, hopefully that have been made by its people, but we know we don't have the capacity a lot of the times. So what we do is um, we negotiate with companies, uh, but we make sure that in the, in the investment negotiations we have with them, there's always a component that they have to build capacity locally. So for example, uh, drones, the first commercial drones were made by a company called Zipline. Zipline uh, was from Silicon Valley, but they, they couldn't uh, commercialize their drones because there was no regulations for commercial drones. So they came to Rwanda, we gave them the space. We agreed to develop regulations with them, which we had never done before. And we didn't know what to do, but we were willing to learn and to, to test it. And when we did that, um, we ensured that they also trained Rwandan engineers to work with them. And today uh, they expanded to Ghana and the people that went to train the Ghanaians on how to deal with th those drones were Rwandans who had been trained by Zipline. So even though we are attracting uh, international solutions, we always make sure that there's a capacity building uh, element where Rwandans are also are going to benefit from it. The same thing with BW from Germany. BW came up with their first uh, mobility solution uh, in Rwanda. So they deployed their VW cars, but also started an, a mobility app, which they hadn't done before. They wanted to do that in Rwanda. We gave them all the support. We welcomed them. We gave them, uh, you know, all the support you can think about. But we also made sure that they worked with Rwandans and Rwandan uh, companies and, and tech companies to really grow the, the, the mobility app. And in fact, the company or summit that VW used at, at the end of the day was a Rwandan company. So there has to be um, a, a, a partnership where, at the end, uh, where the Rwandan talent is also really um, improving. But more specifically for Rwandan solutions, we have a policy where if a Rwandan company is as competitive as an international company, if government is procuring a, a solution, we will give a 15% price advantage uh, for the Rwandan. So that even if they're more expensive up to a tune of 15%, we'll give them a first priority uh, as opposed to an external one. And that's, that's really to, to, to support the local solutions to also uh, come on board, but without locking out international solutions, because a lot of times we don't have the capacity internally to, to develop them. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that, Claire. What I love about what you and Sarah just said is basically one thing I'm hearing is we have to we have to figure out we have to enter these relationships under our terms, and we have to figure out what our own terms are for entering these relationships, which I Absolutely. agree with you. I think is super important. And uh, this is, uh, Okendo, do you want to comment real quick on, uh, briefly on this question of China before I move on to the theme of empowering the youth? Oh, thank you. Well, not necessarily China, but, but certainly I do want to uh, amplify uh, Sarah's comments on the importance of embracing failure uh, because it is very clear uh, from observing, you know, so, so the journey of Horambians. Uh, that it's those who simply embrace that as part of the learning process that ultimately managed to succeed. You know, one of our largest companies, Andela, you know, that really 
everyone looks at the shiny object now, but in reality, you have entrepreneurs like Mr. Abayeji who failed uh, three times before he got to Andela. And I think it's mm -hmm. only through that embracing that process that we will ultimately get to the um, idonia solutions that the continent desperately needs. You know, I, I often tell um, Haramias that it's, 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 it's better to create something that others criticize than nothing and simply criticize others and so create. So, so Sarah, thank you for reminding us of that because it's, it's critically important. Great, great. So very quickly before I move to empowering the youth, because we have about a little bit less than 10 minutes for the um, uh, conversation section of this, you just gave me a thought for a question, uh, Okendo, um, which is, why do you think that is? Is there something culturally where failure is, is shown? This is something I've been pondering and I don't know the answer to, but why do you think it is so difficult to embrace failure in our context? Uh, I'm, I don't know if you understand what I mean by this question, right? Is Does that any, for any, any of any, any, no, any of you can come in. Any, any of, anybody who wants to come in here can come in. Sarah, why don't you, why don't you, since you brought up the topic oh. of failure. Okay, Go ahead. yeah. Uh, it is, I, I've also been thinking about it, but I think part of the challenge is that uh, all failure is not the same. Um, and so I, when I say embrace failure, I'm not saying just by the rara failure narrative of Silicon Valley, because if you're cushioned, uh, your failure has different stakes than if failing means that you you can no longer pay the school fees for 12 cousins that you, pay, you, you take care of. So the stakes are slightly different. And so when I say embrace failure, it means providing the support where that failure wouldn't be devastating for someone who is trying to set up an enterprise, right? And so you find that the people who do succeed, right, are those who come from a higher socioeconomic status because they can afford to fail. Um, and so I, I think the, the, the discussion of failure has to be a little bit more nuanced. Um, um, but having the, the, the cushion and, the, and, and something that protects you when you fail uh, it will allow you to experiment a bit more and will get you to that point where you get the shiny product at the end. And so I just wanted to flag that, that the reason why perhaps we see a different attitude, because uh, if you are poorer, the, 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 you know, the impact of failure is actually much more impactful and reverberates around the community that you're probably taking care of. And so uh, that support is essential. And it goes back to whoever's providing that environment and the infrastructure that Claire mentioned. Uh, it should include that kind of uh, support for entrepreneurs and, and innovators to, to be able to comfortably fail. We're going to touch this topic of failure again right now in a second after I introduce our third team, which is, which is about empowering the youth. So, Deborah, can I quickly step into that one? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Go, go, go well, for it. The, the, I, I, um, I do concur with uh, Sarah. There's certainly something about you know, the, your ability to take risk that um, factors greatly into this. But one, uh, one element that I genuinely also believe needs to happen is we just need to, you know, it was uh, Madame Obiageli Sikwazili who joined the Harambians in, I believe, 2005 um, in Brent Woods and told us, you know, that you ought to, I'm going to butcher her words, but she said something along the lines, you, you must um, acknowledge your failures, celebrate your failures, but never stay with your failures. And, and I do think that part of this it overcoming and creating this culture that embraces this, it's acknowledging and celebrating them. You know, uh, becoming a Haramian is quite the journey. You know, these poor people have to apply and uh, over th this year we'll get 4,000 applications, we select 30 and then they get to join us at Harvard and Bretton Woods. And, um, and, the, and what's interesting about it, you know, you're very accomplished individuals and raise millions of dollars in, for, for the ventures. And yet the first session that happens at Harvard as we welcome for induct people into the Alliance is we actually have them discuss what is their greatest failure. That is the first session, right? You, you, you see the profiles of these individuals, the companies they're building, but the first thing we wanna talk about is your greatest failure and what did you learn from it? And I have to tell you, it is an extremely empowering moment and it, it once breaks the ice and makes a bunch of strangers a family, uh, but also it gets everyone to see that, you know, this journey is, 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 is failure is part of the journey. And I think building that culture of awareness that we've all had our failures, personal, professional failures, and, and that, that takes the stigma away from it. And, 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 and I think it's part of building that culture, right? Just knowing that it's all part of life. And I think sometimes we just see the shiny objects and we never wanna talk about our failures. And I think that's what um, contributes to this uh, 
you know, phobia that we have around it. But I think if we normalize it and just let everybody know we all fail in a daily basis, goodness gracious, I certainly do at least three times a day, um, then we all come to become more comfortable with it and, and embrace it. So, I mean, that's my two cents. But again, I guess the short answer is I have no, no thank clue. You. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you for mentioning that. And when I made the comment earlier, Sarah, that's the component that I was referring to. That it feels to me, at least from my own experience, that culturally, and again, Africa is not one country, right? But from my own cultural standpoint in Western Africa, uh, my feeling was that yes, uh, so failure. There is a stigma associated with failure. Um, and it may have to do with reasons that you brought up, uh, Serum, having to do with economic status, perhaps. But I think this is a, I'm, I'm glad both of you commented on this point, and this is something we should think about. So let us move quickly to this topic of how we empower um, the youth. Uh, so in particular, I want to talk about how, from different perspective, we might build up the skills capacity in the continent. And Serum, you gave me a great idea for a question to you first on this topic which I had not thought about, right? So non-traditional ways, how do you bring in people that come from a non-traditional background? I love the example of the kid you mentioned who kept dropping out of school. Uh, mm -hmm. So I see this basically as, uh, this is somebody who has a non-traditional way of learning and innovating that uh, for better or worse, um, the way our educational systems are set up does not cater to. Can you mm -hmm. comment on how do we empower that segment of the population, which I would say, and you can correct me if you think otherwise, perhaps represent a greater proportion of the population than we might actually know. Uh, do, do, you wanna, do you wanna comment on that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you're right that, um, uh, yeah, I, sorry, I, I agree with where you're thinking is about bringing non-traditional uh, uh, individuals into this conversation of innovation. Uh, initially, when when you sent it, when we talked about how to discuss this, universities came up, and and my my thinking was uh, universities are great for research, and it's nice to have that particular space set out, um, but they are one piece of the puzzle. Um, and I think uh, part of the challenge that I've noticed, particularly with this example that you mentioned, is um, you know uh, basic education uh, is is part of this this challenge. Technical training, um, and uh, so having a, a space for people to um, not having uh, you know universities and particular subjects being the one and and end all be all for education uh, is one way that we can kind of uh, uh, create an environment in which. All everyone has the opportunity to participate in research and development in its in its most diffuse sense, right? Um, and so, for instance, this young person uh, had had he had the opportunity to, I, I guess, attend a, a, a secondary technical school would have had some opportunities to hone in on those skills, and there would have been a different pathway, right? Um, and I think so. Investing a little in in basic education, in basic uh, science, and 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 you know. Uh, all of the basic stuff that you need to get to the university level where you get that experimentation in the research lab, you need to build it at the basic level. And at the secondary level, um, you also need to invest there. So I think in, in a lot of countries, there's a disconnect between the industrialization goal and the kind of training that universities uh, uh, have in position, right? Um, you may not have the foundation. And so when students get to university, they may not have the um, necessary skill to um, to kind of uh, work out the kinds of innovations or the kinds of research that you, you want uh, to come out of universities. And so that makes it also harder for the government to say I'm investing that 1% because uh, I've heard this actually said before that our university students are not producing anything useful so we don't want to give them uh, the resources. But you have to think back and say, well, how did they get to that point where they're not creating anything useful? It started from the basic level um, where uh, some steps were skipped, right? And so I think it's thinking more broadly about education and training and not investing all of our energies at the end, but also starting from the beginning where we have strong educational bases. And if you see the East Asian countries in the last uh, couple of decades, there's been a lot of investment in education at various levels and it's starting to pay off uh, in ways that uh, we now look at as an example, but there was a lot of work done in strengthening basic and secondary uh, education up till tertiary and that's where you get that kind of um, uh, involvement. So for me, it's it's basic and secondary education that needs to be strengthened a lot in this particular way. 
Great, great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Claire and uh, Okenda, I'm going to move to you very briefly, uh, please, uh, so we can get a chance to our uh, participants to uh, actually interact with you and ask questions. So Claire, I want to ask you, so you just heard uh, Sarah. So how do we make this happen from, the, from a policy perspective, from a governmental perspective? How do we strengthen that pipeline at all levels of education that ultimately leads us to this ability to innovate uh, locally? You want to comment on that quickly, please? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, first of all, a few policy um, decisions that we've, 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 we've made as a country. One of them is using our scholarship uh, our money. Uh, so our scholarship program is uh, very much tailored towards prioritizing STEM uh, over everything else. So if you are going to study a STEM subject, you're most likely to get government funding than anything else. So the scholarship was very important. Secondly, for us, uh, promoting skills and youth, especially at the uh, tertiary level, was to attract in universities into Rwanda. Uh, we have Carnegie Mellon University, for example, that has their Africa campus best in Rwanda. We have the Africa Leadership University that is best in Rwanda. We have um, uh, the, the AIMS, African Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Rwanda. So the idea is to really bring uh, those uh, universities and research organizations to Rwanda so that our people can get access to them, but not just Rwanda, uh, but the rest of the continent as well. But also at a younger level, uh, Rwanda has set up some institutions like the Rwanda Coding Academy, where young children um, still at very young ages, primary school can have access to uh, improving their coding skills by going to this Rwanda Coding Academy, which is only one that we have in the country. But these kinds of investments have been very helpful. But maybe also to link uh, skills development with jobs uh, within the Rwanda Development Board uh, that I lead, there is a skills office and their job is really to look at what the investors are, are producing, but also what investors are asking for and trying to link the investors and the jobs that are being created so that people are either getting feedback on what is needed on the market, but also directly getting jobs uh, once they graduate from school. So those are some of the choices and decisions we've made as a country. Great, uh, th th thank you for that. Uh, okay, okay no, I'm gonna ask you very quickly, uh, please. Um, um, what do you think, and this is a question uh, that I would love to hear an answer to, what do you think the role of the diaspora is in all of this? Helping to empower our youth. Uh, if you can comment on that very briefly and then I will go through some of the questions, great questions we've gotten from the audience. I think you're, you, I think you're muted, Okendo. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, we can. I, I, think, I think if you just look at China, Israel, and India, you see what the role of the diaspora could be, right? They're, they're in a sense, very important. Part of the reason Microsoft is, has operations in India, it, it's not because, you know, Susan Smith uh, told them to go to India. It was probably someone of Indian descent who worked at Microsoft, who gave uh, the confidence and the network to Microsoft for Microsoft to actually um, branch out into India. And so these diaspora networks are very instrumental in building those bridges uh, and, and the coalitions that are necessary for this global interaction. Uh, they also are very effective at, uh, as we see in the Alliance, at uh, providing early stage capital. Uh, to some of the entrepreneurs and innovators across the continent. So, so I think um, at the core, uh, when done well, these uh, trust networks are the ones that build confidence in the ecosystem and enable us to make those global connections uh, and uh, ensure that that capital flows to who requires it. Um, but so I, as a short great, answer, I, great. You, I know your, your, your time here. <laughs> great. No, yeah, I want to give a chance to the audience to participate in this discussion. So uh, we, ha we, have, uh, we have great questions here. I'm going to try to get through as many of them as possible. Apologies if I can't get to your question. But let's start with Claire here. Uh, I'm going to put two questions into one related to Rwanda. The first one is whether the digital infrastructure in the country is produced by Rwandan IT engineers. And related to that, one of our uh, participants uh, asks whether the Rwandan government subsidizes or provides phones, iPad, and these type of things so that people can have access to uh, some of these e-government um, platforms that you mentioned earlier in our conversation. Yeah. 
thank you, Demba. And, and I, I must say, Okendo, uh, thank you for the work you do with Harambe. I think a lot of uh, people and random youth have benefited from the work you do. So please uh, keep empowering our young people that way. Uh, on the questions from the audience, one on infrastructure, the actual equipment that is used for deploying IT infrastructure is important. We don't produce that in Rwanda, except for concrete uh, or any other basic infrastructure that is needed, uh, for example, concrete or uh, putting up masts. Uh, but otherwise, the real equipment is important. However, they're deployed majorly by Rwandan engineers. So they're, they're trained, and most of these companies that deploy them use and, and train our local engineers to deploy them. The equipment itself is largely imported. On the question about subsidizing access to iPads and devices, among others, yes, uh, very much so. Uh, all the devices that we use in public schools are completely bought by government. In fact, we attracted a company from Argentina called Positivo. They assemble uh, laptops in Rwanda, and these laptops are uh, under our, uh, an off-tech agreement with government. So we buy almost $10 million worth of um, uh, laptops uh, every year, and we distribute them in schools. Uh, so that's where we that's one way that we subsidize but the other one is um for phones we also have a company called mara phones that is manufacturing smartphones in rwanda for them to be able to do that government also negotiated an off-tech agreement to buy these devices and then lastly um any device that is imported in the country whether it's uh, uh computers or laptops or phones don't pay taxes they don't pay customs duties or vat on taxes to keep the, pro the prices low and accessible by the majority of people so that's what we've done Thank you. Great, great, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, and I'm going to turn to you now, Sarah. Um, this is an interesting question that I think relates back to our discussion on failure. So the question says, much mention has been made on new and, new and innovative thinking around the youth. Um, but this uh, person says, that the fact remains that most young African people operate in an environment where that is not necessarily encouraged. Uh, the question has two parts, uh, but let, let's focus on this particular point here, right? That how do we at the level of the environment that our youth operate in, right? Create a space for innovation. Again, going back to the discussion on failure we talked about, how do we create the, not, not necessarily the, uh, the maker spaces and that kind of stuff, but this culture of failure, innovation, how do you encourage that? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, I don't, th thank you for the question. Um, I, I hear it and I, I'm not 100% sure exactly <laughs> what it's trying to uh, pinpoint, but I would say that um, I think encouraging creativity and play is actually a really important thing um, for children uh, or, you know, whatever uh, environment that people are in, because it is part of what allows people to take risks to tinker and experiment with things and get to that innovative point. Um, and so being able to play and, and, and be creative and also, like you all said, to be comfortable with failure. Um, and these are things that are, you, you, you might be able to teach it through curriculum by allowing courses that uh, encourage experimentation and play in a way. Uh, and not devaluing it uh, as not serious work because it is actually when you're when you're in the lab experimenting in some ways you're also playing um so i think encouraging that kind of uh attitude at all levels of education is, is crucial uh, and encouraging young people uh to to do that i think is, a, is one way of doing it and you see it in, in different contexts work out um uh, you know towards innovation um yeah thank you Th thank you uh, kendo i have 30 seconds for you here um quick answer which is so this tech-driven innovation we've seen during COVID, do you think it has contributed to uh, tackling the problem of youth in, in employment? Has it, in your opinion, has it? Uh, is tech contributing to youth unemployment? The, the decrease no, in is it contributing, no, the decrease in youth unemployment, this innovation that is driven by tech and the youth, is it contributing to this problem of youth and employment that we have? Well, in 30 to seconds, it, I, can, in 30 seconds I can do two things. Yes, well, well, I can do yes. two things for you in 30 seconds. One, I will share with you all uh, in partnership with the Oppenheimer family uh, here in South Africa. We've launched uh, uh, Harambia's Global Summit. And as part of it, we have the African Innovation Report, which really is chronicling the progress of um, market creating innovators across Africa. So I'll share that link with all of you uh, on the chat. So if you're in case you're interested, um, uh, and that will probably give you more deeper insight. But I think as you'll see from the report, uh, uh, the answer is absolutely yes. We, it, there's clear evidence of that happening um, um, 
you know, we know that these small businesses are ultimately the ones that employ most of the individuals. Um, and these startups are creating um, high quality and high paying jobs. And I think we all really ought to get behind them. I, apparently, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations once says that the UN was not created to take mankind to heaven, but to save humanity from hell. Well, I will let the experts in the UN opine on that, but I certainly believe that African innovators were not just created to take Africa to heaven, but to bring African paradise to the rest of the world. And so uh, call me crazy, but I, I genuinely think if uh, more and more of us get behind these innovators, we'll clearly see the results. But thank you all. Thank you all for, thank you all for a fantastic discussion. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. And I will be in touch with you offline. And thank you for the audience. And we'll now look at the poll results. And I want to thank you for joining us. So on our question of whether or not you agree that government and private and public partnerships should make investments that facilitate access to technology, particularly in early education, 65% strongly agreed, 27% agreed. So, okay, so 92% of the people agreed to some extent with this statement, 6% were neutral and 3% disagreed. Uh, thank you very much for participating. I really enjoyed this conversation and I look forward to being in touch with some of you uh, offline. Thank you very much. Have a great day. God bless you all. Pleasure, Sarah. Pleasure, Claire. Thank you, Bye. Demba. Thank you,